Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Elliot, a junior doctor in the UK that is specialising in psychiatry. I've stumbled across a gold mine of a YouTube channel. It's called Pika Grape Snack and it's got loads of old historical videos, particularly to do with psychiatry. Let's see how it holds up by today's standards. I'm sure glad. You're a saviour here. You can put me in perspective and tell these people that I'm not a nut. That's still something people say today. The stigma against these mental illnesses is still rife, unfortunately, particularly with the more severe ones like schizophrenia and some where people can be very, very judgmental about perceived choices. So that's things like substance misuse and addiction. Well, of course, anything you tell me will be confidential. But I don't want it to be confidential. I want you to sell the interview to Playboy, send it in and give the money to charity. Why would they buy it? Why not? Just as good as anything I've ever read in there. Straight off the bat. I love it. And this is really how manic people can present. There is this sense of grandiosity that is really common in mania. Grandiosity is where people have this sense of self-importance and usually is either grandiose identity, where I am somebody particularly special, or grandiose ability, where I have a particular power or influence. Again, very, very fidgety from the energy that he's got because he's clearly manic. Are you going to say something that will interest them? I imagine it'll sell. I've got one of the most brilliant minds of the 20th century. They might like it. Just make sure the money's given to charity. Give it to Bangladesh. Make sure the kids get the food, though. Don't give it to some idiot that's going to pocket the money. If Playboy doesn't want it, sell it to Penthouse. If Penthouse, Penthouse doesn't want it, kiss my ass. <coughs> So as well as this grandiose identity where he's got the most brilliant mind of the 20th century, he's also very socially disinhibited. That filter from here to here that makes you go, hmm, should I say that right now? In mania, out the window, that's gone. Hence the They don't do it now, they won't be able to do it later. So it's their opportunity. If he has a sense, he'll buy it. Of course, I wonder about Hefner having an ounce of sense. He plays pinball, <laughs> but I'm sure he's got brains. If he runs a magazine like that, he's no dummy. It will come as no surprise that people with mania are very, very talkative. They have something that's called flight of ideas, where you have so many thoughts and so many ideas that come into your head that it's difficult to finish one full thought and idea before you move on to the next. Another idea, another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. People often feel really creative. And the way that we can tell usually if somebody has flight of ideas is because how it affects their speech. They usually get pressured speech, where as soon as a thought comes into here, it has to be said through here. Again, the filter from here to here, gone. I want to know more about the treatment you've received. Is this the first time you've been in the hospital? This is the fourth time. How long ago was the first time? About six years ago, September of 1976, and I'm doing well. What a good boy am I. During that time, would you describe your mood as being depressed? Yeah, it was despair. Utter despair, utter despair. When someone says bipolar, most people think of mania, like how he's presenting at the moment. But actually for a huge number of people, the highs aren't always the problem, it's the lows. It's bipolar depression that can be more damaging and debilitating to somebody's life than the highs. That's why it's so important that whenever you have somebody presenting to you in a clinical setting with low mood, you must, must, must ask about potential signs that they've had highs, either hypomania or mania in the past, because the treatment of bipolar and unipolar depression are quite different. Utter despair, utter despair. And what about the second and third times? Second time it was uh, fear, paranoia, paranoia and despair. Third time it was, God, my ears starting to itch. Paranoia can be seen in the lows and the highs. People that have bipolar depression can often have really intense thoughts of guilt. They can be convinced that they've done something catastrophically wrong. That can also lead to paranoia that somebody's going to come out for revenge or that the police are going to come and arrest them or that they're going to be assaulted in some way because they've done something wrong and in a way they feel that they kind of deserve it. In mania, the grandiosity where you feel so important or that you've got a particular message to share can lead to people being paranoid that someone's going to try and silence them or is going to be out to get them or that there's a conspiracy out to try and take them away so they can't spread their message. Third time it was so-so. It was a rough trip, a rough experience. Uh, they were very tough on me. But it was pretty good because I knew what I was talking about. Uh, but I wasn't being given credit for what I knew, for the actual common sense that I had. People, everybody was telling me I was crazy, you know, but I knew better. God, is it bright in here. Boy, is it nice. Uh, you feel the sun? Yes, I do. It's nice. Oh, yeah. But, uh... yeah, I'm sorry. My teeth feel like they're, they're so clean. It's unbelievable. Really sparkling clean. My gums are just seething with energy and, and lifeblood. I, I can... You can feel the roots being energized, just the blood flowing to my gums, to my teeth. It's good. Grandiosity, again, 
I knew what I was talking about. They kept telling me I'm crazy, but I knew better. Very, very distractible. Distracted by what's out the window or the brightness that's in the room. And flight of ideas, teeth, gums, all of that stuff. Mania is such an easy diagnosis to make. Within about 30 seconds of speaking to someone, you can tell if they're manic or not. If you're ever in a position where you're not sure if somebody's manic or not, trust me, they're not. Mania is like the easiest diagnosis in the whole of medicine. Ah, uh, yeah, the fourth time. This is the best. You can't beat it. Um, I feel extremely secure, very happy, very loved by people around me. People are attentive to me, you know, like, like you and I are. God, I've never seen so many beautiful women in all my life as, as in Bloomington. <laughs> they say LA's got the beautiful women, and I say, <laughs> this is much better. Maybe it's the students. So are you a student? Yeah, I'm a student. What are you majoring in? I'm presently in the graduate program in journalism. That's really, really good. And I think that's a nice little clip because it highlights that between relapses, people can be functioning really, really well. These relapses are treatable and people can get their function back and engage in all the other stuff in life that, that most of us without bipolar would be able to do. Bipolar is very treatable. We can't cure it, but we can certainly manage it. Unfortunately, he's had four relapses and the more relapses you have, the more likely you are to go on to have even more relapses. It kind of reflects a more severe illness. Same. Cheer, cheer for old Notre Dame. Wake up the echo sounding her name. I've lost count of the number of times that that's happened to me. I've been in the room and I've been speaking to a manic patient and they've just burst into song. It's part of being very energetic, very euphoric, very disinhibited. You're allowed to smile if that happens. Obviously don't laugh at the patient, but you can't exactly pretend like it's not happening. What about this time in the hospital? Have you been worrying about anything in particular? Well, I was in tune to the fact that my friend's wife was pregnant. And I had also thought that Olivia was pregnant at the time, Olivia Newton-John, although I realize now that she is not pregnant, uh, but I had assumed this cross-transference, and as a result of that, I had assumed that she was pregnant, and if she was, I didn't want to take the chance, so I just got a call for help intuitively. So you wanted to help Olivia Newton-John? Yes. Intuitively. This is starting to say to me he's not just manic, he's probably psychotic as well. I really, really wonder if he might be having auditory hallucinations. And when he's saying intuitively, what he really means is he's hearing the voice of Olivia Newton-John. Olivia Newton-John, I think, was quite big in the 80s. That's before my time. In the UK at the moment, usually I see patients that feel like they've got connections with the royal family, often with whoever the prime minister is at the time. I've had a few that feel like they're connected and related to Shakespeare in some way. What is your relationship with her? I'd rather not discuss that. Have you talked with her? Yes. How do you communicate? Intuitively. And what does she say to you intuitively? She says, go get him, tiger. So this is either delusions to do with grandiose ability, that you can telepathically communicate with somebody, or he's having auditory hallucinations, hearing the voice of Olivia Newton-John when there's nobody else in the room. And you also got the impression that you were supposed to help her intuitively? Yes, exactly. How did that... What effect did that have on your hospitalization? Well, some dummy was under the impression that I thought I myself was pregnant. And apparently they reported that I thought I was pregnant. And so they thought I was ill, so they felt it was necessary to hospitalize me. I clarified with the dummy that I was not pregnant or under the impression that I was pregnant because I realized that I am a man and I don't become pregnant. I don't conceive children. Physically, I conceive them mentally. Oh my God, there's so much grandiosity coming out in so many different ways. When you say that you conceive mentally, what exactly do you mean? I believe that the first stage in the process of a child being born is the first half of conception, which is termed the immaculate conception, which is the first cause and first positing of the possibility of a child being born which is conceptualized, first of all, in thought before it actually takes place, if you do it right. Of course, if you just want to stick your prick in some chick and have a kid, then, you know, if that's your limited mentality, then that's the way it goes and have it. But I don't work like that. He lost me then. Usually, if you're listening to somebody and all of a sudden you go, hang on a second, how did we get there? I'm lost. Did I just space out and miss something here? Usually they have something called thought disorder. This is a common feature of psychosis of lots of different causes where one thought doesn't lead sensibly into the next thought. And there's lots of different types. In this case, flight of ideas is a type of formal thought disorder where you don't finish one thought before you move on to the next because you've got so many thoughts coming into your mind. If you're assessing somebody in a clinical situation and you find yourself going, hang on, what? And let's rewind. How did we get there? Ask yourself, do they have thought disorder? Unless you actually did space out, in which case have a cup of tea and perk up. How would you describe your mood over the past month? 
Very anticipatory. 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 What have you been anticipating? Well, I was anxious to get down to school, get an apartment, get settled, and get in the, uh, the, the groove. And what happened? I got in the groove. And you ended up here? Yeah. Anticipatory. Well, anticipatory, if you're American. Um, interesting. Part of the paranoia, I suspect, that you're anticipating something to go wrong and that someone's going to be out to try and harm you because of who you are and what you know. I need to restructure my medication, see? They, they had me on, on some shit called Lidome, some drug. What is Lidome? This is 1980s, so we had quite a few medications in the 1980s that could be used for bipolar. We had some of the early antipsychotics, haloperidol would be one. We had lithium too. We had benzodiazepines that were there to try and sedate. I've got no idea what Lidome is. If anybody knows, pop it in the comments below, I'm interested. And uh, they kept telling me to take it, take it. And I knew it wasn't gonna do me any good. So I quit taking it about six months ago. And I told them, if they're gonna give me Lidome, I'll lie to them too. Lie dome and lie to them. So there's rhyming. Doing lots of rhyming, again, is common in mania. We call them clang associations. Not taking medication in bipolar, particularly when you have lots of highs, is unfortunately very common. These medications are not only there to try and stabilize your mood in the midst of a relapse, they're there as maintenance agents to try and stop you from relapsing again. The more relapses you have, the longer that you ought to take these medications to try and minimize the risk of another relapse. So I quit taking it. Now I'm being restructured on a new medication. I'm taking Haldol and lithium. Haloperidol and lithium, like I said before. Haloperidol is one of the earliest antipsychotics. It's a little bit sedating as well, but it will help treat the psychotic symptoms that are associated with his manic episode. Lithium is one of the best mood stabilizing medications that we have, still is today. We still don't really understand how it works. It has like a million different actions in the brain, but which, if any of these things, are what causes moods to stabilize? but it's probably the most effective mood stabilizing medication that is good for the highest of highs to the lowest of lows. It does need careful monitoring though. We were talking about your mood and how you feel you're in the groove. Would you describe that as feeling euphoric? No, I wouldn't say it's euphoric. How would you describe it? It's like feeling integrated, having something to do and getting it done, being tight on time. Have you been more energetic than usual? Oh yes, I certainly was. He's really energetic and buzzing still. If this is what he's like when he's already started a new treatment regimen, I imagine things were a lot worse when he came into hospital. We've already talked about high energy levels being common. Euphoria, this sense of feeling great and fantastic. It's really common, but it's not the only presentation of mania. Sometimes all this energy can make people feel really, really irritable and very, very angry and quick to change in their emotions. Not everybody that presents with mania presents as, as well, as likable as this chap is presenting. How would you describe that? It's a need to perform. <laughs> uh, to put on a show, you know. I was listening to the Chambers Brothers, Love, Peace and Happiness, and God, it was coming straight on time. Really, the timing was perfect between their music and my thinking, my, my emotions. Every time a muscle would twitch, they'd hit a cymbal or something. It was amazing. What a brilliant video. I think that's a really nice depiction of pretty much every core sign and symptom of mania that you can possibly get. What it does also highlight is that the treatment in the 1980s of using antipsychotics and lithium hasn't really changed. It's basically still how we do it today. But I really, really enjoyed that. I'm looking forward to going through some more of these videos. Let me know what you thought in the comments below. And as always, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe, hit the notification bell so that you know when there's a new video that comes out. And I will see you very soon for the next one. Thanks a lot. Bye.